Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we are again thankful for this day. We thank Thee, Lord, for the scriptures that have been preserved for us, and especially this book of Revelation. As we go through it, Lord, we ask that Your Holy Spirit would anoint our minds, help us to understand, and also that we might communicate Thy truths with precision and truth and clarity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, right, wow. <clears throat> We had an interesting thing happen at the beginning. I, um, I changed this from part 30 to 31. Um, uh, I did it through my cell phone, actually, which I, th I was thinking to myself, well, this is amazing. You know, a little device like this, and you've got a little app, which is a PowerPoint. You can bring it up on your app, and you can change it and send it off through the network and do all these things. And I have been looking at this idea of making an app uh, for our materials. You know, if you've seen some of these apps, they're really neat. And they can communicate with your website. So you can have a central website and then you have an app which communicates and finds and organizes things in a way that's quite apparent and will alert people to new things uh, that have happened on the website. And they can then go to a video, look at it and so on, all on their machine. So I've been looking at this and uh, looking at the language needed to uh, write the code and finally compile it. All this stuff is free. You can get it, put it on a Mac and make it work, hopefully. Well, we're looking at the book of Revelation and uh, we've been looking really at chapters 14, 15 and 16. Last time we took a little interlude and the reason why we took an interlude is because we're up to now part 31 and some people who've been watching this series, if they weren't made aware, could perhaps get the notion that uh, we think that the Bible is sort of like a glorified buffet meal and that we are now going to take things out of the book of Revelation as if they were writing about things today, which we do not believe. We believe that these things are essentially talking about an age which is to come on this earth in a time in the future when there's going to be great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And that this is connecting with God's prophetic uh, utterances that he made through his prophets in the Old Testament. That this is really a connection with the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. And that you can go into the minor and major prophets and you can read all about the book of Revelation and the things pertaining uh, to the book of Revelation in the Old Testament but that the things that pertain to this age were hidden and kept secret. And if you want to answer questions about the will of God for this age, then you have to go to Paul the prisoner. Paul the prisoner. Now, I'm not just saying go to Paul, you notice. And that makes our fellowship here kind of unique and different than what you'll find uh, espoused by many grace believers. There are people who are grace believers and they have some pretty influential preachers and teachers. They do. They're quite influential. They're on the radio, they're on the TV. But here's the distinction. At Northside, we understand that Paul's ministries must be divided. He had a first ministry where he went to the Jew first and that ministry goes along with the prophetic program of God through the prophets he connects with the new covenant and what he said was no different than what the law and Moses said should come he's in line with the the prophets that is Paul the man of Acts Paul in his first ministry was, uh, was preaching and teaching a message which was in conjunction with the promises of the prophets. But when you jump across the great boundary, when you cut across Acts, the 28th chapter, then what you do is you traverse some ground uh, into some new territory. Last time we were talking about over here, before Acts 28, you'll find all sorts of trails going on. And they are all through the Old Testament and the Gospels 
and into Romans and into Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, you will find trails of teaching that are based upon what the law and Moses said should come. You'll find it. But when you come over here, once you jump across the boundary of Acts 28, something new was begun. Brand new was begun. A new beginning, and Paul gives a new trail. The mystery. And we are learning certainly about that in this church. But what's happening is, we realize that there's going to come a time when the age in which we live is going to end and God's purposes with Israel will resume. And that resumption of His purposes, we're reading about in the Apocalypse. So we're reading about things over here, uh, which pertain to the time which is going to come on this earth. We live in this age where the purposes of God concerning our age are revealed for by Paul and I write it this way as you know uh, remembering the gold that you'll find in Paul the prisoner the revelation the apocalypse talking about time to come so you notice that was quick wasn't it <laughs> where's the review it happened <laughs> And here we have something that's kind of interesting, and I'm going to point this out to you a little bit later on, because I think it's time for us to address some of the kind of interesting dogma that has uh, come into the Christian church and has been held by many sincere Christians, and yet I wonder whether they have thought through the consequences of the teaching. And I'll be pointing this out soon because it pertains a little bit to these chapters that we're looking at so if let's just look quickly in uh, revelation 14 15 16 revelation 14 begins verse 1 and i looked and lo a lamb stood on the mount sion and with him and 140 and 4,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads here are some overcomers that god is going to use and they go through great persecution and and trouble but one of the things you learn as you read through the book of Revelation is specifically here in chapter 14, 15, and 16, and then finally on into 17 and 18, is that God, while He is going to put Israel through a kind of hell, He's going to give them some chastisement. It's certainly true He's going to do that. What happens is He turns the tables on those that persecuted His people. And they then come under the condemnation of the rod. So it's an interesting inversion of things that, that happen. On the one hand, it's the time of Jacob's trouble, no doubt about it. But then vengeance calls out from the temple. And what happens is that those who went against Israel and gave them all sorts of trouble, they in turn get trouble in a massive way and in chapter 17 and 18 you get a, a going back again through these things and specifically going through uh, this city Babylon the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and it's interesting to see how that's written in your King, King James Bible if you just quickly go there chapter 17 verse 5 and upon her forehead was a name written mystery Oh, yeah, so here's a, another mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon is the source. Babylon is the source of a, a great promotion of false teaching and doctrine. And what we'll find is part of this false teaching and doctrine does relate to man, his nature, and destiny. It does. It's related to that. And we'll see some of these things as we go forth. But today I want you to just get a feel for what's going on in 14, 15, and 16. See if you can see some structure that's going on here. So it begins with this tremendous remnant here um, that are sealed, 144,000. 
And then what you have is, you have in verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven, this is chapter 14, verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. Can you imagine uh, making a movie and taking these words, these scriptural words, and really bringing the, the possibility of the sound? You know, one of the things I realized about good movies is the sound. You, you notice that, that you put good sound into the movie, oh, it just changes the whole quality of the movie. And similarly here, you can imagine this voice, thunder, voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousands which were redeemed from the earth. So here comes those that are redeemed. These 144,000 have a special place and ministry. And they are going to be preachers. Massively good preachers. And you go through this here. And it talks a, a lot about Babylon. See in verse 8. And it says, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, wait a minute. Didn't I just point out in chapter 17, this same city? See, that shows you the nature of the book of Revelation. What it does is it shows you a progression, a progression of judgments that come on the earth. And then what it does is it comes back and then highlights one very influential part of it and then expands on it. So you find that in chapters 17 and 18. It does that. The, the book of Revelation is not linearly written. It's not like here and you just keep reading and then, you know, time ways it fits in like that. It doesn't do that. It gives you a sequence of events and then what you do is you go back and see some primordial important part of that and then it expands on it. And that's what chapter 17 and 18 does. And as you go through here, uh, you get through um, chapter 14 it then comes right down to the end, verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple. So these angels have very influential places in this vision that John sees. And he also having a, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. The grapes are fully ripe. Have you ever picked grapes from the vine when they're fully ripe? Do you know that when they're fully ripe, sometimes they are so sweet and almost nectarish that your, your, no, your nostrils can smell it. The grapes, they're, they're just ready. They're so ready, man. They just about pop. And when... Uh, sometimes I notice because where we, we live, or we used to live in New Zealand, it was a place where there are many vineyards and quite successful big companies like Nobolo's Wines. They, they would sell these wines right throughout the earth. I mean, certainly here in America, you'll find Nobolo's Wines, which will be um, produced right down the road from where we would live. And they're quite successful. But when the time would come for these things to be ready... It was an amazing time where uh, the, the people who were harvesting, they would hope that there wouldn't be too much rain suddenly because that would swell the, the clusters and make them pop and all sorts of stuff like this. And they would be very careful. Uh, in the early days uh, of the time we were living there, my father was an electrical contractor. And uh, he was an electrical contractor for many of the vineyards. And so during, well, just about any time because... Their wine was important to them. They had them in these great big vats. And so if there was ever an electrical problem, this was a serious thing. So at any time, at any time in the night, anything goes wrong with the electricity, ring, 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 and uh, my dad <laughs> had to get up in the middle of the night and off he'd go to fix whatever problem they had. And th they'd go at any time. But this idea, grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in her, his sickle, verse 19, into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress 
of the wrath of God. Now, you've got to see and hear a massive judgment. It can't be anything else. But with a harvest, there's two aspects of a harvest, isn't there? There's kind of like the crushing of the grapes, but then there's also a time of the, the fruitage. It's, it's sort of a, it's a plus and a minus here going on. We only see it in a negative sense. We only see it in terms of a great judgment. But there's other things happening here. As I said, Israel certainly has come under great scrutiny. But there's also those people who have brought judgment on Israel. They've got to be judged. And Israel also, uh, that is God's elect, will be rewarded. And the winepress was trodden without the city. Okay. Now we've got a locality. And it's outside the city. And the blood came out of the winepress. This is an interesting picture that when the grapes are broken, the, the blood of the, the, the grape will come out. Even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Well, it doesn't matter how you reckon this, this is going to be a massive distance. 600 furlongs, some reckon this to be about the dimensions from north to south of the prophesied Israel. It's, it's no small dimension. It's a massive dimension. And so what this will mean, precisely, we don't know, but we, what, must be, what it must be telling us is that there is going to be some massive, judgment take place here it's going to be something very massive and then in chapter 15 you notice it's got these eight verses now chapter 15 is like a parenthesis it's like okay you're seeing this sequence now i'm going to get you ready with a little discussion about what's coming and what he's going to warn us with in the first verse is i want to show you how huge these last judgments are so this last this this chapter 15 i should say is like a little parenthesis explaining the the massive nature of the vials that are going to be broken and released on the earth and just have a look at verse 1 of chapter 15 and i saw another sign in heaven great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them look at it is filled up the wrath of God. Fills it up. So, this is very different. You know, it's not like one third of the fish, or one third of the land, or one third of the sea, or one third of the vegetation. No, no. This is going to be quite a massive thing that's going to come. And so if you follow this down a little bit, uh, look down at verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who live forever and ever. Oh, look at this. Seven angels, seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, there's a lot of fulfilling here. There's some fulfilling of the wrath of God. It's a massive time. And then in chapter 16, off it goes. And then you get this massive description of huge judgment coming on the earth. It's just absolutely massive in its nature and we'll look at some of these things uh, it involves things to do with the euphrates and all sorts of very interesting uh, names which are part of the prophetic scriptures but what i want to point out is this notion of in them verse one is filled up the wrath of god now some christians look at the wrath of god being filled up it with the eternity of hell, the tradition of hell. You see, that's how God fills up his wrath. But here what we see is these plagues that come on the earth. These are the things that fill up the wrath of God. And this brings us to this whole notion of, well, obviously not everyone is going to be saved. 
some people are going to reject the offer of the plan of salvation. They will. They hear it and they say, no, I don't want that. And others will. Now here, um, about the mid-1600s at Westminster in England, for the Church of England, this, was, this basic confession was written up by the various scholars. And it's been basically taken to uh, the Reformed movement. And today this is very much a part of the Reformed Church. Well, it's broken up the number of chapters, and this one here in chapter 10, I just copied and pasted this, chapter 10 uh, of Effectual Calling. I just want to read it to you. I want you to, 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 to kind of understand. I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. I just want you to understand it. That's all. For, for now, let's just understand what it says and what it would mean. Right? So here, all those whom God hath predestinated unto life, and those only he is pleased in his appointed time effectually to call. So that starts it off. Only those who were predestinated unto life, and those only, only those, he is pleased in his appointed time effectually to call. Effectually, with effect, you see. It's not just a, it's sort of like a general call. But no, a very specific call which affects people to whom it's directed. It says, uh, in his appointed time, affectionately call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation. By Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly. See, again, and savingly. What I want you to understand here, that the writers of this did not have in their mind that, oh, okay, uh, you are brought to Christ by the strength of witness. And by the strength of witness, you make up your own mind. Right? When I preach and I teach, I try to convince you. And in my mind... It's not like I'm thinking, oh, God is going to reach down and is just going to tell you, yes, you do it. In my mind, what I'm doing is I'm appealing to your understanding and I'm appealing to your faith and I'm appealing that you, having control over your own free will, will make the choice to believe what I'm saying because it's scripturally right, it's God's will. You see what I'm saying? This is not that. And I'll show you, it, it confirms this as we go down further, okay? Because it really nails it as you go down. It says, Enlightening your mind spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them an heart of flesh, renewing their wills, and by His almighty power, determining them to that which is good. Determining them to that which is good. And, again, this word, effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Now, here it comes. You see, we can see determinism in there. There's no doubt about it. The confession is saying there is a deterministic drawing. It's not just like it's a great argument and you're drawn to the logic of the argument and so, therefore, from your free will, you'll choose it. No, it's not that. It's not that. It's saying this is a deterministic thing that will make you a believer. Now coming on down, it says, and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so, oh wait, yet so as they come most freely Being made willing by his grace. Oh, wait, now the last line is where you've got to understand. Because you're not going to understand this at first sight. I want to explain this. Being made willing by his grace. Yet so, as they come most freely, being made... Okay, this is what's called compatible, compatible free will. Compatible. What does that mean? What does it mean? 
compatible free will. It means that determinism and free will are made compatible. How? How can it be that you will free, but freely choose this? It's this compatible notion. I'll tell you what it is. Okay? It's like this. You have been given all of the facts of the case. You have been given the faith to believe. And because you have the faith to believe, which has been given to you by God, deterministically, just you, not the person sitting next to you who was not predestinated. The person sitting to you was not predestinated and was not given that free faith, right? You, because you're given that free faith, you choose God. You've got no other choice but to do that because you were given that free faith. By God. And determined to be so. But you did it freely because, well, that's what you've got. <laughs> you've got free faith, right? It's given to you by God. And so, I've got faith. Of course I'm going to believe. You freely do it. <laughs> now, here's something. I want you to think about this. Okay, because this, this is the crux of the whole argument. Okay, I'm going to go across here. And I couldn't get this book straight so I, I went to a, a an Arminian who wrote a guy by the court by the name of Jerry Walls which I would advise that you have a good look at his uh, presentations because they're very good on this subject why I'm not a Calvinist but this is a quote which is taken from a book by a Calvinist a very influential Calvinist by the name of Piper he's, he's an extremely influential Calvinist now this is what he says in his book, this, this Calvinist. He says this, uh, But I am not ignorant that God may not have chosen my son. So now he's getting very personal about this. That God may not have chosen my sons for his sons. And though I think I would give my life for their salvation, if they should be lost to me, I would not rail against the Almighty. He is God. I am but a man. The potter has absolute rights over the clay. Mine is to bow before his unimpeachable character and believe that the judge of all the earth has ever and always will do right. Now, what he's saying here is, well, I would give my life for my children, my sons. He's got these two sons. I'd give my life for these two sons. I have that much love for them. But, if it was not God's will to have them saved, because remember the nature of how people are saved according to this doctrine. The way people get saved is, God gets them. He chooses. You don't choose at all. You are bound by sin. You have no way of making a choice. So God gives certain people faith, and others, he chooses not to give that. And then you most freely come to him in this, combat this compatible way where determinism and free will meet together. Okay? Now, I want you to look at something. And just think about this passage here. And I want to give you just a couple of uh, verses from John. This is John... Um, chapter 17. Just go across to John 17. I want you to see something here, which I think will make you, well, at least reconsider these things in a different light. John 17. John 17 and verse 24. He says this, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now, the interesting thing that I think we need to ponder here with this verse is that God does not need us to have love, right? 
So one of the things that the Calvinists talk about is how that God's glory and his sovereignty are the main issues, and chiefly his sovereignty. But you notice that here there was a special love between the Trinity going on before, even before man would be there. Here's another passage I want you to look at. This is um, John 15. Verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Now notice the context here of love. It's importance. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. The Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world. It existed. Now this love is to be continued in the followers of Christ. If you just go back another chapter, this is chapter 14 and verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our bow with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the fathers which sent me. And then it goes on, and it says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before, it come to pass, that when it has come to pass, ye might believe. Notice the centrality of love. The love that existed between the Father and the Son before the foundation of the world the basis of love and fellowship in the disciples, and how this was to continue on. Piper, of his own sons, says this, uh, I am not ignorant that God may not have chosen my sons for his sons, and though I think I would give my life for their salvation, if they should be lost to me, I would not rail against the Almighty. Don't you find this a little bit strange? That God doesn't seem to have the love that a human has. The human can give his life for his children, right, who might be lost, that they might be saved. But God apparently says, no, I'm not going to save some of you people, but I could. I could save you, and you could come freely. I'm going to save all of you people whom I predestinated, and you will come freely. But here's the trick to that statement. The trick to that statement is, according to the confession of faith that I've just read to you, he could have done it to everybody. Every single human being could come to God freely by his determining grace that's the teaching now what I'm saying to you is this before we start taking on doctrines we better make sure they're consistent with all the scripture and if you make one particular doctrine about who God is and you say that's who he really is he's Sovereign, and I'm going to make all the other doctrines adhere to his being sovereign. Unfortunately, what you're going to end up with is some massive contradictions and some logical fallacies. And you're really going to have to, in the end, point your finger at God and say, Well, actually, God, you don't have as much love as I do. But don't you think that's a bit serious? Don't you think that conclusion is a little bit serious? I mean, I, I, I'm not a Calvinist. Because I, I can't see how this business of God saying, 
Well, actually, everyone comes according to their free will, but I determine that by putting faith into certain of them. And I choose not to do it to all. That means it's like saying, well, I could save you, but I'm just going to glory in seeing you burn. Right? It makes robots out of us, in a sense. Right? Makes, makes us into robots. So, coming back here to the book of Revelation, um, we see in chapter 15 and verse 1, that uh, certainly it says, for in them is filled up the wrath of God, the other aspect of this idea of getting correct doctrines is making sure that words mean exactly what they mean. And not saying, well, I'm going to make God fill up his wrath by burning people forever and ever. Right? I think that's going to be another one of those consistency that things that we need to look at. More and more I'm seeing that Christianity has been hoodwinked. Massively hoodwinked. Don't you agree? It's unbelievable, man. It is just a sinister plot by the devil, I believe, to take away Christians from the pristine Word of God, putting interpretations onto it that have put them into shackles where they live their whole life in fear of death, as the book of Hebrews says. But Christ came to take that away. He didn't come to, to endorse Babylon the great, the mother of harlots. That's not what he came to do. And her doctrines. Surely we've got to, we've got to expunge those things from our, our, our being and our doctrines. We've got to get rid of those and bring forward the word of God rightly divided. Well, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee again for uh, the Scriptures. We pray, Lord, that we would be ready to uh, give an answer for the hope that's in us, Lord, with all the Scriptures bearing on it, rightly divided. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.